So, ladies and gentlemen, yesterday um, uh, we, uh, we took on a lot of material. Um, in our opening session, in addition to reflecting on the previous day, I demonstrated to you how models of complex systems exhibit coupling between different parts. I showed you a links and hair system, but really that, that was just a detail. The links and hair. In fact, it was links and hair. Um, it could have been opioid users, their primary care physicians, uh, ED physicians, uh, police officers, uh, correctional personnel, um, uh, those involved in social work, uh, drug dealers, and a set of others. It could have been a lot more compartments, and we would have seen similar overall features that if we look at any one variable, it tells us, it whispers to us about the system as a whole. Um, and um, there's a lot of substance there, but basically the system has lots of moving parts, but often we can understand salient aspects across the system using data from just certain points in the system. This is why I say data sources are not solitudes. Data sources tell us a story about the broader system that gave rise to them. They, they speak to us about their history much as our own situation in life speaks to us about our life experiences. Um, we then went on, following that exposure, um, to an articulation of, of data system science and a, sort of a perspective on data system science. This wholesale merging of aspects of data science and system science to synergistic effect. Um, I spoke about that yesterday, I'll be coming back to it. I won't expand on it now except to note that I articulated a set of elements of it or principles of it, as it were, which I've also put in the Google Drive um, in, in, in written form. Okay. Um, uh, we then went on to discuss the third type of big data, health big data, um, that uh, I wanted to cover, which is uh, smartphone wearable based data collection. I, str I argued that smartphones and wearables are, have, are situated in this uniquely privileged position because they straddle these two worlds that, that both ref where, where things both reflect our situation, our health situation, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and, um, and our uh, health exposures. Uh, but those worlds also influence constrain and influence our situation. And finally, they're important because, uh, in very important ways, because uh, the, uh, they can serve as very formidable uh, intervention vehicles. So I talked about smartphones and wearables and their role in health research, and I highlighted a couple areas where they have a particularly central or powerful role to play uh, quite clearly. In the afternoon, um, we went on to uh, a particular modeling approach, hidden Markov modeling. And hidden Markov modeling um, uh, allowed us to try to um, arrive at insight about a system in the world that exhibits dynamics. Dynamics between a set of states that are categories. At any one time, the system's in one particular one of these broad states. Maybe a sitting, standing, walking, or a situation where the phone's off person. I like to throw in lying down as well. Um, so within his, uh, hidden Markov models, the system's in at any one time one of these states, but we can't observe that directly. All we get is occasional observations, or maybe regular observations, it can be either one, that give us hints, but often where those observations are incomplete, noisy, sometimes misleading, um, and yet we're interested in using those to understand what's going on in the underlying system at any one time, over time, etc. And hidden Markov models provide us two ways of kind of probing this, two algorithms that are prominent. So given the situation of, of an underlying 
an underlying situation in the world that's going between states. Um, and uh, given some observations that are partial and maybe sometimes only episodic that probe us, they provide us a way of, of coming up with possible models that can describe this situation, a so-called hidden Markov model, where we posit a certain rate of change among these states, and we posit a certain set of states. And then we observe, uh, using our observations, we have, a, we have a function which tells us the likelihood, if you're in a given state of observing this observation, or that observation, or that observation, if there's only a couple observations, or small discrete set, we'll use an emission matrix. Okay, it can be done for, for a larger number of discrete observations, too large emissions matrix. It says for each state, what's the likelihood you'll observe this observation or that one? Or we'll specify a probability, a likelihood distribution that says, if I'm in a sitting state, how likely is it that I'll observe this level of acceleration or that one? And given those pieces, and given a posited transition matrix that we think this is how it might be in the world, we could then undertake many tasks. Among thing, other things, we can assess what's the likelihood we would see this entire sequence of observations. And there might be some models that make that sequence we observe empirically extremely likely, and some that make it extremely unlikely. And we can kind of find models in an unsupervised context, the context where we don't know the true situation. We find models. We optimize the model to find a model that is most likely to, pr to, to produce or, or to, to explain these sets of observations over time. And we use their what's called forward-backward algorithm, which calculates for the forward-backward algorithm for, for a given time period, it's discrete time, we have discrete states, a set of discrete states, sitting, walking, lying down, whatever, and, um, and then we have discrete time. And, and a forward back relevant will say, for this period of time, what's the probability you are sitting? What's the probability you are standing? What's the probability you are walking? Right? Um, and it takes into account data, not just from this time, but data from before this time, and data from after this time. We can also do it just the forward algorithm and say, based on data we've observed till now, what's the probability of sitting now? Hmm. And that's not judged in isolation based on just the latest data point for now. It's based on what I was doing last time. Because if we're dealing with one second bits of time, probably what I was doing one second ago is a pretty good indication of what I'm doing now. So if I was walking one second, I'm probably still walking. If I'm sitting one second, I'm probably still sitting. It's not to say there's no chance that's captured in the transition matrix, but the chances are pretty good. So that information from the last time, the data from the last time, is also very relevant for my current situation. Hidden Markov models also support, on top of the forward back rhythm, something called the Viterbi algorithm. And that predicts the single most likely sequence over time of, of states to explain this, this observation, set of observations, the sequence of observations. There's also a way of training these models that's supervised, where we know the situation for some labeled cases, and we come up with a model based on that supervised state. And we compute from the known cases, we compute a transition matrix. From the known cases, we compute the emission matrix or the um, distribution function. And in fact, both the examples we show we're using a supervised, uh, supervised approach. In other cases, we've used unsupervised approaches. Um, we use hidden Markov models for many things, for labeling behavior, sure, labeling context, indoor, outdoor, in vehicle, off of vehicle, is the phone on your person or not, so. Um, are you coughing or not? We have a very nice hidden Markov model that, that, that can tell us when we are coughing and if we're coughing, with quite high accuracy. You can also use hidden Markov modeling for making sense of the data. So some data from Ethica, for example, we use a hidden markup model to give it to us in a convenient way. Um, you actually use a hidden markup model that will tell you at each time, like, is the state on, or sorry, screen state, is the screen on of, on a phone? Because the data from Ethica is more like when it's turning on and when it's turning off and it can have gaps in it and this will fill in the gaps nicely. So hidden markup models, one of the real reasons 
that are very desirable is because they can deal with missing data. Um, and um, uh, Chin Yang referred to that in her presentation uh, on uh, cigarette, cigarette classification. Okay. So we use them for prosaic issues. We use them for more sophisticated issues. Um, and we saw some case studies which showed them. And then in the final session yesterday, I introduced particle filtering. And particle filtering is a little bit like hidden Markov models, not surprisingly. That's why I introduced hidden Markov models first. Um, particle filtering <coughs> also involves, so in, in hidden Markov models, you posit there's some process in the world going between a set of discrete states. In particle filtering, we posit there's some process in the world going between a set of continuous states. Missing one. Discrete continuous, what does that mean? Well, by discrete states, I'm not talking about states that don't tell your secrets, right? D-I-S-C-R-E-E-T. Uh, -E -E um, uh, I'm talking about states that are countable, that you can count up a, a small number of, of distinct, defined states, a small count of them, or a count of them. It doesn't have to be small. Um, continuous states, I'm talking about things that vary continuously. So let's, let's use the analogy. Um, a given state of a hidden Markov model is I'm sitting. Mm -hmm. A given state of a model simulated like with particle filtering we'll be seeing today is a full state of a, let's say, for, for, for ease of, of introduction, a system dynamics model. So here we have SEIR maybe, a certain number of people susceptible, a certain number of people exposed, a certain number of people infected, and a certain number of people recovered. And if I wanted to summarize state of hidden Markov model, I'd just say I'm sitting. That completely summarizes what state I'm in, right? Um, here, just completely summarize the state, I have to have a vector, a, a sort of a four numbers, put it in, in this nice form. Um, uh, a certain number that are uh, susceptible, this would be a number, right? So maybe it'll be, you know, um, uh, 992, right? Maybe there are uh, three people in the exposed state, right? Maybe there are two people in the um, infected state or the effective state, right? Um, and maybe there are three people in the recovered state. That would be an example state of this system. And I say it's continuous because, you know, this could be larger and that can be smaller and it's, it's, a, it's a wide range of continuous possibilities. Um, so uh, this is a continuous state. And hidden Markov models help us deduce what state we're in at a given time. Uh, and particle filtering does as well. Um, with hidden Markov models, we are dealing with likelihood functions. Given a certain state of the system, given that I'm sitting, what's the, what's the likelihood I would observe, you know, a really big level of acceleration, given that I'm sitting, right? Um, and I, I'll, I'll have that for each state, right? Given that I'm walking, what's the likelihood I'll observe that high level of acceleration? Likelihood functions are key to hidden Markov models. Likelihood functions are key to particle filtering. So for a given state here, we will say, what's the likelihood I would observe 10 people getting infected from the real world at a given time step? Or a given time, given, given time slot, let's say one week's time. Mm -hmm. um, and so likelihood function that says, given this state, what's the likelihood I would observe a certain observable, a certain empirical datum, which could be one number, or it could be a vector of numbers, like a certain number of adults, a certain number of children. That's going to be key to particle filtering. Okay? Um, the state of a hidden Markov model is going to evolve. The, the idea with a hidden Markov model is the state of the world is changing over time. And and it changes out from under us, right? It's changing over time. We're having observations. We're trying to understand at different times what state are we in. That's the same thing with particle filtering. The state of the model is changing over time. And we're trying to get a, a read on it. Um, so there's a lot of similarities there with particle filtering and hidden Markov models. But there's some differences, ladies and gentlemen. 
One of the big differences with hidden Markov models, we put all our eggs in one basket. We, we were essentially for, well, okay, sorry. Um, so I have to speak, uh, speak carefully here. So with the Turby algorithm, we get out a single most likely sequence, right? Um, that's, that's not a, um, and, and then we might say that is the likely sequence. With particle filtering, we do that less often. Um, with hidden Markov models, the forward backward algorithm gives us a distribution over states, right? It says for this period of time, there's a, a distribution. There's this chance I was in that state, this chance I was in this other state. So there's a 60% chance I'm sitting, a 20% chance I'm standing, a you know 5% chance the phone is off person, and a 5% chance that I'm walking, or 2%, 5% right, chance I'm walking, right? If there's some to one. And so it is with the particle filter. We're going to have, from our algorithms, the ability at any one time, we'll have a probability distribution over these states of the system. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to say there's a certain probability we're <coughs> in this state or that state. Now, technically, it's a probability density, okay? Um, because these are continuous. Um, it's not like there's a 10% chance for this one and a 80% chance for that one and a 10% chance for the other one, and that's all the three possible. No, there's a continuous set. So it's actually a probability density. It's a, a, you know, it's a, it's a kind of uh, uh, measure that reflects the continuous nature. And I won't drive that point home with too much fineness. Um, and, uh, but we'll have you know, a sense of like, is this more likely to apply than another state, right? Uh, and maybe it will be two, one, you know, three, and then, you know, nine, nine, four. We're assuming the same overall population. You know, we might say, is this 10 more likely to be explained by this guy or this guy? Mm -hmm. and, and that likely it would tell us. And we'll have a probability distribution over each. And, you know, probability distribution over the states that would say this one is a lot less likely than that one. That's a posterior probability distribution. Having observed this datum, I'll have a posterior probability distribution over these that has taken that into account before observing it of a prior. And the same thing occurred with the, with the, with the hidden Markov model. Before I observe something, I have, a prior I have a prior distribution based on where I think I was last time and the transition matrix. And that gives me a prior distribution uh, for what's my probability of being in each state. And, and then I observe the data, and that gives me a posterior. Mm -hmm. um, take into account the likelihood. Um, and so it is with, with this as well. Um, so it is with uh, particle filtering. So there's a lot to build on conceptually from yesterday's lecture on hidden Markov models for today, which is going to be all about particle filtering. This will be like particle delight. Okay, they're, they're not like. You know, going wild. Um, okay, um, I'll just mention one or other two other points, and then we can use the washroom. Okay, um, so <clears throat> I put here two states. I drew them, right? There's going to be a lot of different states, example states that we might pause it as explaining, them, right? Um, in the particle filter, we, or sorry, in the hidden Markov model, we just had one probability factor. It said, what's the probability I'm sitting? What's the probability I'm standing? What's the probability I'm walking? What's the probability it's off person? Remember that? Um, here, it turns out it's not convenient. It, it's, it's not feasible for us to represent the probability distribution, a simple vector over all these possible states. So instead, each of these states is represented by something called a particle these possible states. So this is particle one. He thinks, he thinks it's, you know, that's particle two, she, uh, women are more, normally more sappy, I found. So this is, this is female, this is male, okay. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, particle three, here's particle four. That's, that's uh, 
that's in, yeah. anyway, I won't go on. Um, so, so we'll have many particles. And normally, we might have thousands of particles, right? We'll have thousands of these particles. And each particle has a different view of the world that thinks, oh, I think there's this many, and she thinks there's that many, and this one thinks he's a stubborn male, and he thinks, you know, there's this, this, there's this, that most of the people are recovered. And, you know, this other one, um, you know, uh, thinks this, and this other one thinks this. And these particles will be jockeying for, they're going to be competing to explain the data. And they'll be associated with a weight. Each of them will be associated with a weight that rewards them. So it's larger if, if they've been consistent and, in, in, uh, in, in, you know, uh, consistently matching the data well, they'll have a larger weight. And uh, so this would be the weight for one, the weight for two, the weight for three. And that weight reflects their credibility. It reflects kind of their, the degree to which they've been consistent. And it actually reflects their degree of representation in the population. So something with a weight of two compared to a weight of one we count this as being twice as well represented in the set of particles. If we consider the distribution, that, 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 that one is twice as frequent. And we'll never draw from these particles except with a probability according to their weight. So we'll, if, if we want a sample from the particles, like to draw a nice diagram or to report a mean, well, well we won't compute the mean over the particles directly. That wouldn't be meaningful. We'd compute the mean over a draw from this where the probability of getting each one is proportional to its weight. And that will mean this will be occurring twice as often as this one. If this weight is, say, two, and this weight is, is one, right? Um, this one will get be drawing twice as often. We'll just draw it with a probability according to the weight. If there's one of 10, it'll be five times as likely to be gotten by this one than, than, than um, uh, 10 for that. So if we want to take the mean over this, we might draw a 1,000 of these and take the mean over, over those to get a mean state. Uh, we wouldn't just do it over the particles themselves. That wouldn't be meaningful because this guy is actually, this lady, excuse me, this lady uh, is twice as, as widely represented as this other. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, so particle filtering um, doesn't allow you to neatly represent the distribution, like coming out of the forwards, backwards algorithm, the distribution of our states. So we represent it with these particles, and we give weights to the particles to represent how many are there kind of like that relative to one another. And actually, the weights will, the weights will actually sum to one. They, I, I've shown them as like two and one, but that's, 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 that's kind of immaterial. They're, they're just, they're going to actually sum to one, but the same principle applies. This might be point two, and that might be point one. Okay? Um, so, uh, and, and that's how we, um, um, that's how we'll, we'll, we'll sort of deal with it. Okay, um, so particle filtering and Coleman filtering are, diff are close cousins at many levels, and I hope this has given you some appreciation for how we can leverage the understanding from hidden Markov modeling and translate it into particle filtering domain. Let's take a break now, and um, we'll uh, reconvene in 10 minutes for some more particle filtering. And soon enough, we will be fortunate to uh, learn from the next generation. And uh, Sayan will be giving a talk on uh, measles and, and pertussis, OK? Um, and her uh, extraordinary groundbreaking modeling in that area. Okay, so let's let's come back in 10 minutes. Thank you very much.